We the, the thing that always hit me with you when when I was observing you or or whether I was on the receiving end of therapy, if I was being therapized, so to speak, is how you use your voice. Oh well, this is uh, th now this is yes. So this might be a habit. Okay, this is a habit. If I want clinically to um, work developmentally, something people might say aggressively. Uh, then I will lower my voice as yeah. we go down developmentally through the years. Yeah. So I will go down. Yes. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook, and Jackie Jones. <clears throat> Welcome back to the next episode of the therapy show behind closed doors with myself Jackie Jones and the I don't even know I keep saying wonderful I need to find a new word the wonderful Bob fabulous dear fabulous, fabulous. <laughs> yeah no there's a word awesome all the I've just gone, done uh had some therapy by a new physical therapist and as she was explaining the different things she was doing and I was for the first time attempting to do them. And when I did them right, she kept saying, awesome. Awesome. And, I, and when I went to Canada recently, um, to Vancouver Island for this friend's mine's wedding, um, they use the word awesome over there a lot. And I quite like it, but I also like fabulous. Fabulous. <laughs> yeah. Right, I need to change the word. I'll change the word. No, you can say wonderful, but I do like all, all these different types, you know, or delightful, delicious. That's I was one. thinking, is there a word in in I don't I can't even think it starts with an in. I don't know. It'll come to me. Anyway, what we're going to be talking about is the habits oh. that therapist needs to cultivate to enhance the therapy. Yes. What again, what a wonderful subject. And they're so important because you know, if I look back at my career at the habits I've, you know, um formulated or evolved or whatever you like. I do them so unconsciously. That's what I was thinking when you said this. To break it down, it's it's an everyday occurrence, so you mm. don't really pay much attention to it. Yeah. So, as I said, I was having this discussion with somebody still working 30 years as a therapist, and uh, she said, what do you mean these habits? Um, and I said, you know, habits people cultivate. I'll tell you one of mine that I've cultivated over the years is to um, offer a cup of tea to the uh, client that comes through the door. Yeah. Now, when I said that, she started to think real off these types of habits because unconsciously she's been doing them for years and, you know, um, I have as well. But uh, one thing that I think, you know, now I'm talking on the podcast is when I look at, back at these habits, which we're going to talk about, for me, they've all, all, all of them are cultivating the relationship between the therapist and client in some way, whether it be of a pro protective mechanism, whether it's be around boundaries, whether it's around making them cups of tea, whether it's a, whatever it's around, it's in the aid of change and positivity in building up that relationship with the client. Yeah. And these habits or, you know, unconscious things that we do are going to be individual to each therapist as well. Absolutely. It's not something you learn in, in training. It wasn't something I learned in training. And I can remember in the early days being really conscious of everything I was doing in the room from the moment they walked in to the moment they left. Oh, oh, oh. So what would be, if you thought back, I don't know how long you've been practising now, but what would be a couple of the habits that you could think about exactly the same as you always offer them a cup of when they come in mm. i was always conscious of having snuggly blankets and, and cushions mm. i don't know but whenever i was in therapy i always felt cold i don't know whether that was just me or just sitting still for 50 minutes i've no idea but i always make sure that there's a throw on the back of the chair or or something that they can put on um, that was something else that I always did, checking in with them just, you know, before we start, just an opening up, you know, how's your week been? So that they could just start the conversation. 
And I always had a table in between me and them as well. I don't know whether that was a boundary that I needed or I don't know. Maybe that says something. <clears throat> I mean, all interesting habits. I mean, uh, I, I like the ones particularly about the blankets and the tea. They're all ones around nurture. Yeah. And I know you're nur you know, nurture is really important for you, but I think nurture is important to building up a relationship which has got a level of nurturance in it is important because a lot of the clients we see haven't had nurture and i know for some people it's too overwhelming and we could have a discussion about that however i think to have a, a, a positive ambience yeah uh, and a protective space and a warm space by the way yeah uh, i know different people you know, have different psychological temperatures. So they might, when people get frightened, they may go to a cold place, which has nothing to do whether the heating's up high or not, um, which I've learned over the years. Um, but what is important is a, a warm, safe place. And also our therapist that is thinking about these relational needs. Yeah. And they get, you know, in the early days, letting them know the structure, how it works, you know, <clears throat> where the toilet is and you don't need to, you know, put your hand up or ask for permission. I'd show them where it is and, you know, you can go anytime. It's not school. Just general things to put them at ease to start off with. Yeah, well, what you talk about that is structure hunger. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I think that's important to think about what I would call relational needs and for structure, for stimulus, for nurturance, for safety, for all the things we've just, I think they're important, if you like, habits to cultivate. I mean, I, I, um, all those things, oh, it's got, sorry, all those things are important. And also, I think I always go into the habit of, um, if it's a 50 minute session, I did 55 minute sessions then, by the way, was closing down on the session mm. five minutes before the end. So in other words, checking out they were an adult eager state as much as they could be. Yeah. And uh, not going into um, emotional material with four minutes left. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I developed that almost, I didn't have to look at a clock. <laughs> yeah. Knew, knew, almost like five minutes before 55 minutes before I even so that 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 was something I learned earlier on in my career and what I developed habitually I think with clients yeah and I, th I think that's that's a good habit as well is that you know you you end on time and it doesn't drag on it doesn't go over the 50 minutes or the 55 minutes as much as they might do that, you know, door knob comment or something, it's it's very difficult with some clients. Yeah, so that's one habit. And on the back of what you've just said, that another habit that I definitely um, followed throughout my career was to start the session with and something like this. And looking back at the last session we did, how was it for you? Yeah. And providing a sense of continuity between the sessions was something which is sort of hallmark yeah. as a therapist. For me, it's it's kind of has anything come up for you mm. during the week on the last session? So yeah. that if there is anything, you know, yeah. that they wanted to to say about it, whether it was a good or you know, not good session or whatever it is, that they could do yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, and that provides continuity. Yeah. <clears throat> physical continuity as well as psychological continuity and yeah. also immense attachment so if you're into attachment theory then you'll like that process we're talking about here yeah and talking about attachment giving the client plenty of warning if you were taking a week off or if you had oh, a birthday coming up yeah, that they yeah. knew you know sort of four weeks before mm. That from this date to this date you know i'll i'll be away so that there's there's no very, shock yeah very very important that's a habit that became instilled in me yeah so that i would certainly give all my clients that level of notice so they would feel accounted for and they would 
prepare, if you like, yeah, for that absence rather than saying it's a sort of regressive abandonment. Yeah, just telling them the week before I'm not here next week, and suddenly yeah, that's, it's. That's, yeah. <laughs> I think that's really bad practice. Yeah. So that yeah, so that's a habit I also de- developed. Confidentiality is another one which, well, it was ingrained in my training, um, but became, of course, ingrained in me. So that is, an all therapist, that should be really a fundamental byword. So is that a habit? I don't know, but it, it it was in terms of thinking about it, in terms of making sure that in my life, all these things stayed in the therapy room and don't spill out out elsewhere. Yeah. I don't know if that's a habit, but it's certainly an important principle. Yeah. What about note taking? I never took notes. See, I do it all the time. I have I have a separate book. There's a habit of yours. <laughs> yeah, I have a separate book for each client, just a, an exercise book. And I, I do take notes, which is something that obviously we contrast well, in the contract and we talk about it from the first yeah, session. Yeah, I better say a little bit more. I never take notes because, you know, it's not totally true. Um, I have very good compartmentalization in my brain so things can go in I think the best way to say it Jackie rather than say I didn't take notes I didn't take many notes yeah mine are illegible and probably wouldn't make sense to anybody else except for me I have notes books and I did have notes for clients but I didn't make extensive clinical notes yeah I mean in my training it was uh, taught to me that I had to make notes you know for very different reasons ethically so I've always made notes but I suppose I was responding to lots of therapists I know that make copious notes yeah no I don't make copious notes yeah but even (laughs) us doing doing our podcasts I have my exercise book out and I'm I'm making notes just that's what I do and it's yeah so so that's another habit that I got into yeah so I think I was responding more to the uh, when you said that about taking notes um, in response to say you're in a relational therapy with a client uh, and stopping to make notes and things like that so any notes that I ever took or I wrote down I did write down quite a lot now I'm thinking about it uh, it was always after the session yeah yeah never in the session I remember meeting uh, a colleague of mine who was Twitch <laughs> who's did uh, one year with Fritz Pearls, who was the creative gestalt psychotherapy. And we were talking about notes and he said, oh, I'll give you a story about notes then. He said, he, he started his first year of training when he was 21, I think, Fritz Pearls, and he did, he did one year. He said, uh, when Fritz Pearls came into the room, he, he told to all his students, 40 students or whatever in the mountain there, put all your notebooks away. No note taking in any of my training. Wow. Which would have hated you. You would have I'd be lost, me. yeah. <laughs> and the reason he gave, is to, I mean, this is different from therapy, isn't it? Therapy sessions. But the reason he gave was that it, 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 by taking notes, you're interrupting contact with him. Yeah. And I, I get that. It is true. Yeah. And I know my colleague always didn't moan about it. And, well, the most wrong word, to say afterwards, oh, I lost a fortune. Just think, if I'd have managed to make notes of all the wonderful stories Fitz Pearls had said, I could have actually put it in a book and sold it. So, you know, it's like, I, I, what I'm trying to say is that in therapy sessions, it wouldn't occur to me to make notes. The notes I take would always be after the session. After, yeah, yeah. It's an interesting one, because I know therapists often take notes in the session. Yeah, I, my- I, I do take notes in there. I wouldn't say I take notes, but I will put something down like a word or something. That's mm. why my notes wouldn't make sense to anybody else. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I learned a wonderful way of doing it without losing eye contact. I could write on a page without yeah. looking I'm down doing or anything. Yeah. yeah. So it's a, it's a good discussion to have because I know a lot of therapists do make some notes. So, but that's not a habit I did. But, it, but I suppose a habit would be that after them, after 
the sessions I might write something down. Yeah. Because my memory, um, I've got good memory, especially for emotional content, but I still needed to jot some things down. Yeah. Um, and One of the things you always did with me, and it used to get me every time in training, and I, I've done, you know, I did the four years training with you, but I've also yeah. done a yeah. couple of, um therapy marathons with you oh yeah three day ones yeah yeah and whenever we were having a session you would always just pick up a box of tissues and place them in between us <laughs> there's a habit and it was literally bob you're doing it again move the tissues <laughs> and, and that's one of the things i'll always remember about you and inevitably i did need the box of tissues <laughs> yes yeah, so there we are there's a habit of mine. That you've picked yeah. up. That's true, especially in the three-day marathons. It was very strategically done, I thought. Yeah, and, and uh, other habits might be around, um, and not for me here, but therapists who think about cushions, who work with cushions, for example. Yeah. Particularly. They might have different, how many, I don't know, three, four cushions, or they might put the chair so many meters apart from the other chair people often have their own habitual way of doing things yeah, yeah. So i think another ha ha habit is around protection yes so i'm always i will habit i will always um inquire about uh what i might see as lack of protection because so i think protection another one i do all the time is think about adult ego state capacity yeah, yeah. Whether that you would count that diagnostic habits, I'm not. It so is. Sure. It's like a checklist, a mental checklist, really, isn't it? When when you're starting, particularly with a new client, you, you know that you you're going through these things, and then, like you say, protection and adult capacity, because things change week to week mm. when the client walks in the door. Mm. No, even yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I, I I I'll build that habits. And it'd be interesting for people like yourself or to tell me what particular habits I might have cultivated over the years. Certainly you're right about tissues. Yeah. We The, the thing that always hit me with you when, when I was observing you or, or whether I was on the receiving end of therapy, if I was being therapized, so to speak, is how you use your voice. Oh, well, this is, uh, th now this is, yes. So this might be a habit. Okay, this is a habit. If I want clinically to um, work developmentally, something people might say aggressively, uh, then I will lower my voice as yeah. we go down developmentally through the years. Yeah. So I will go down. Literally, observing you was like watching a master, a master class. And it was like, it. yeah. Yeah. I trained a little bit in hypnotic induction. Of course, hypnotic induction is to aid relaxation. But one of the things I learned there is the lowering or howling of the voice, depending yeah. on what you want. So, for example, if you want somebody to be more empower themselves and you would, your voice would go up higher. Yeah. Now, I did a lot of work with the younger self, so then I would drop my voice. And it so was the speed as well, just slowing things down, kind of pacing as well was, yeah, I noticed. So that's a habit which is um, methodology yeah. linked, in other words. Yeah. It's a clinical way of thinking. But you are right that if I want to go backwards down yeah, developmental self to where the trauma is or whatever we're dealing with or the relational deficits, I will lower my voice. Yeah. See, these are, these are the things that I love about psychotherapy is that there's so many different avenues that you pull together without even really knowing it. They, they just all come together, sorry. Um, you know, which is why it can be exhausting being a psychotherapist sometimes. If you've got a full day, it, it's not just sitting on a couch having a chat with somebody. Literally, you're forward thinking, you're, you're working in the moment, you, you're noticing the body language and any changes and you're doing your, it's, it's, it's all 
avenues all in one go. Oh, absolutely. Another habit, self-care. Yes. But you're just talking, you're talking about the importance of self-care here, really. Yeah, yeah, not burning out. I I get astounded when I go into my centre sometimes and or I hear that this therapist or that therapist has done work with eight clients in a day, for example, or something like that. You know, I've always built up self-care so that I wouldn't see perhaps more than five sessions in yeah. a whole day and that I would, you know, go out for lunch and that I wouldn't see, um, I don't mean by that is I go, I'd have a lunch for an hour and a half, walk around the block, make sure I'm walking to a restaurant or whatever it is. Yeah. But I wouldn't go from, say, you know, let's say, say, let's say somebody sees a client at nine till 10 or I see a client at nine, 10, I wouldn't see a 10 o'clock client. No, no. The next time it would be at least half an hour. I always used to give myself one for oh. filling in notes or whatever it is after. And, and yeah, just I agree totally going out for lunch, getting out of that therapy space, mm. just, you know, a reboot of energy to come back in for the next one. The thought of being in yeah. the same room, seeing a client after a client after oh. a client. Yeah. Well, therapists forget, I think. I mean, energy. I was trained also in an energetic therapies. And of course, when we're dealing with the dark sides of people's energy, what does a person do? They don't want that dark energy. Yeah. Depression, for example. If you sit with somebody, forget therapy, if you sit with somebody who's depressed for 20 minutes and you walk outside the door, you're going to feel pretty shit yourself. Yeah. Now, if you're working with somebody who's depressed, for example, they will want to get rid of that energy and you're the only other person in the room. Yes. So they project, they won't say, right, well, I'm going to give you this energy, but it will be an unconscious process where that, yeah. that energy is projected onto you. Now, I used to always think this is about massage, by the way. Uh, now, if you go straight to another client, you may give that energy, that Impressive energy which has come from the previous client unconsciously onto the other client oh. for example because you'll want to get rid of it yeah i very much believe in having gaps between clients and going for a walk or putting some of that spray down in the room which cleans the air so that we can get a break in the energetic system which is more healthy yeah yeah, I completely agree. And it's not just the depressed client, it's the anxious yeah. client. It's just a client, the anxious client. It, whatever it, whatever it is, yeah, yeah. Because we're working with, we're, we're often working with quite negative energy. Mm. Massage therapists, one of my, this is one of my pet subject areas, who are dealing with people's energies all the time. They shouldn't see, I don't believe anyway, they wouldn't shouldn't do one massage after the other. They should clear the energy and yeah and uh i don't think people think enough about what people project onto other people in terms of energy yeah and I, you know exactly like you said you know if you not necessarily in a therapy room but if you're out having a, a drink with a friend who's down you, you know it does <laughs> it brings you down as well yeah yeah energetically if nothing yeah. else so self-care is another habit which I would promote therapists start to, uh, you know, cultivate. Yeah. And, they'd be and if they don't, they'll probably, several things will happen. One, they run the risk of burning out because actually what often happens is the toxicity builds up and builds up and builds up. They take on people's negative energies, energies and energies, and they take it home. And then their wife or partner, or if they live alone, um, all this unhealthy processes. So I think it's very important for the therapist to think and cultivate self-care. Yeah. It's also very good modeling for clients. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, th I think you, you, you're completely right, you know, and, and self-care can be modeled in the therapy room. And sometimes the client doesn't like it. <laughs> You know, like I said, for making sure that you're finishing on time and, you know, the, the sessions don't extend or 
if they turn up early that you don't start the session early then you know the time is yeah, boundaries. and that's it boundaries yeah, yeah. you know but to me that's part of self-care yeah couldn't i couldn't agree more another habit that i cultivated specifically in group therapy and while i'm thinking about this how much i did it in individual therapy i'm not so sure but i did it religiously in group therapy and i think it came from some therapists who were in the TO world called the Gouldings who did the same thing and said, and that is that I always started the group therapy with each client reporting back good news. I like that, yeah. And where that comes from is these, these therapists called the Gouldings who advocated that because it, it, it meant that the client would at least talk for a moment about something positive that happened mm. and start on a positive note even though we might go to different places mm. and i religiously did that for 36 years i More. think that's a really important thing because you know I, I i have had this conversation with clients before now that you know they can talk about the good things in therapy it doesn't all need to be the bad stuff we can talk about the positive things that you've achieved in this week or and it is nice to reflect back when we're not in a good place that's all we can see it's all we pay attention to whereas if you break it down you know it's like if a client says oh I've had a really bad week why what happened well on Tuesday this happened well what about Monday yeah nothing really happened on Monday well that's a good day then <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah being able to point the positives out as well so i always started with groups like that over the, and that's i was known for that and that's a habit if you like that i, I like that yeah that I cultivated uh, yeah. Over the years i don't know how much i did it individually but i always did it in groups yeah some therapists where i don't want to say a uniform but the clothes that they wear are, are oh. like a, a, a habit or the, the image they want to portray yeah. or, or something, yeah. They want to model down to their clients, for example. Yeah. Um, as I say, it is the argument against giving a, you know, offering a cup of tea to a client on sessions, but I, I always did that as well. Mm. Now, I, I know my argument for it. I know there's an argument against it, but it's just a habit. It was a habit of mine. Yeah. Yeah. To offer a drink, whether it's water or tea or coffee or or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, other habits? Oh, I always make sure there's a clock in the room. Yes. <laughs> yes, as you can see, I always have a clock somewhere. Yes. Yeah, yeah. One over you. Um, so I think we all develop ha habits, and some are much more practical. Some are methodologically linked. I like to think that most of the habits I've cultivated, perhaps are you know, specific to me, are in the service of positivity for therapeutic change. Yeah. Yeah. And I could explain all of them away clinically, by the way. I could even explain the arguments against them as well. But, but for me, they are thought out clinically and there's a clinical aspect to it and it's always in the service of positivity from my frame of reference with the client yeah yeah i like that but also for me as a therapist i i like to feel comfy in my workspace as well which is easy for me because i work from home it was more difficult if i was you know in a shared space that was used with other therapists but for me, like I said, having cushions, uh, you know, enough cushions that people can make themselves comfy, having blankets in there that I know, you know, if, if they want to snuggle or if they're cold or whatever it is. And, you know, having, I have radiators in my room, but I've also got a heater, you know, that people can say, and I'll put the heater on if I just want to give it a bit of a boost. And flowers, I used to like flowers in my room as well. That's a really good one. I remember going to, I used to teach in Australia, uh, people, you know, I taught at the Adelaide, Adelaide Therapy Centre, and um, I remember one of the colleagues I met there, I remember one particular, she used to say to me, do you know what, uh, one of the habits I've cultivated, not she said she spoke like this, but anyway, I'm sort of deeper, 
she said i i'd have lots of make sure that i got lots of sweets and chocolates and uh, sweetie things uh, for my uh, psychotherapy intensives because a lot of the work she did was working with regression and developmental work and when you become young what do you want sweeties <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and it was clinically thought out and that became into a habit over the years and she she was kind of perhaps for over 50 years i'm sure um and you'd always see in her um jars loads of sweets now that's something i never did because it'd be empty all the time and i'd be the size yeah, of the well, house i wouldn't yeah. go well, <laughs> <laughs> that's self-care for you but it's the habits to people and usually usually the habits are clinically thought out yes yeah and then they become habits they become ingrained habits yeah they often have well you usually have a clinical thinking behind it yeah i do I, I suppose i had like a mental checklist that i would go through you know with the room and everything before a client came and my preparation to seeing the client would start way before the time of the client turning up it yes. wasn't like I'd be sat watching Coronation Street and then the doorbell would go and that would be it. I would be in the room. Mm -hmm. There was a run up to it for me. That's right. And I bet you yeah, all the people listening to this, if they're therapists and even if they're clients, they'll recognize the habits in their therapists. Yeah. Will have their unique styles. And that many people, by the way, do what exactly what you talked about. They prepare 10 minutes beforehand. Yeah. Uh, and many people have uh, have cultivated habits, usually from clinical thought. Mm. And it in needs the to be of, through clinical yeah. thought, really. Yeah, yeah. And in the aid of the relational uh, effectiveness. Yes, yeah. Oh. And we all are all individual. Like I said, I don't... I think we did do some training around, you know, towards the end, looking at, the therapy room you, do you know what i mean not necessarily how to furnish your therapy room but about this that space and you know how to make it appropriate type of thing you know yeah having a, a red therapy room or i don't know but the habits certainly wasn't spoken about because it is individual to everybody yeah and usually has clinical thought so i remember a therapist I saw for quite a long time um, always sat in the same chair and then and she'd she'd put the chair at a certain distance to the clients now you know I didn't say to her you know I didn't, I didn't talk to her about that and I'm not sure what she would even have said but I guess she might say well I just like the chair or yeah. or she might just say something like well I have the chair so many so distance apart because I feel that has creates a professional boundary. Often it's clinical led. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, and talking about chair, I did have my own chair that I loved my chair, um, and it would always be to one side of the room oh, unless yeah. I was seeing a couple, and then I would move it so I was literally in the middle of them if they were sat on the couch, so yeah. that it wouldn't be seen that I was on one side or the other. It was important. I was in the middle, literally. Yeah, so that becomes a habit, but it was... Yeah. 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 So the, the more we've spoke about it, the more I realise that, yeah, I am quite habitual in a lot of the things that I do. I do have quite a few. And yeah. it's, it's an interesting conversation to break it down. Yeah, and as I said, and I think I've said this about 16 times in this podcast, that the what may seem as idiosyncratic, for example, what you just said about the tissues, for example, will nearly always have clinical thought on behalf of positivity and building the relationship up or some thought process yeah. on the benefit of the client. Yeah. 100%. I've really enjoyed this conversation, Bob. It's an interesting one, though. Isn't it is. It? it is, and it's, it's something again that you don't really think about. It's 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 habitual habits that that we have. Yeah. We build up. Yes, over time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Right. No, no wonderful. And um, I look forward to the next one. I think the next one is sixty-eight, or is it sixty-nine? Sixty-nine. We're heading along to my birthday. We, we're getting there. Seventy-one. 
Yes, so. it won't be long. <laughs> <laughs> I want to. So, I'm really looking forward to that one because I can say, I, a, a podcast for every year of my life. We need a special topic for seventy one then. Yeah, yeah. We won't pick narcissism. <laughs> we, we, we need, we, yeah, no. We need to pick a special topic for. We'll have to think one. about it. We'll have to yeah. think about it. Yeah. Okay, do Until next time, Bob. Yeah. Look forward to. Bye bye. Take care. Bye. You've been listening to the Therapy Show, behind closed doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.